ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our uh, 25th annual lecture, if, I, if I'm counting correctly. I will uh, give a short introduction to our uh, today's speaker, but first I, will, I would like to thank the host, the Anglo-American University, for having us here and for co-organizing this talk. And I'll give the floor to President Jiří Schwartz. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, so I am in completely new role um, and position, of course. It was about 27 years ago, in 1995, when the Liberani Institute just hosted the first annual lecture. And uh, the first laureate was um, Nobel Prize laureate uh, Gary Becker. And so today, so I am in the position, just not to speak for the Liberal Institute, but for, for somebody else, and that is Anglo-American University. And it is a great pleasure for Anglo-American University and honor, of course, to, to host this, this lecture and to have such excellent speaker. So thank you very much, so, and enjoy this event. Now, before my remarks, we have one more introduction. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome Prime Minister Mirek Topolanek here among us today. And I hear he's a fan of uh, Professor Kaplan's, so I'll give the floor to you now. Hello, everybody. I was a little bit surprised uh, uh, then Jiri Schwarz and Martin Panek asked me uh, to present some short speech uh, with my English. But uh, I have maybe two remarks or maybe two, uh, two hmm, parts of my questions and my doubts and so on. When we started with Jiri Schwarz in uh, uh, University of Economics uh, in Prague with uh, interactive lectures uh, for students uh, uh, with, with goal to introduce to students uh, some other schools, economy schools, uh, and uh, uh, it was very interesting. And we, uh, it was course of uh, econ economy of public sector, I think, something similar, Yuri, yeah. And uh, uh, we, uh, we introduced uh, James Buchanan's public choice theory uh, with this rational ignorance and so on. And I, every time, uh, had, had some some internal feeling uh, to introduce uh, opponents of, of James Buchanan. And it was Brian Kaplan and his book, uh, The Myth of uh, the uh, Rational Voter. Uh, and uh, Brian, Kaplan, uh, Brian Kaplan had a very extremely big uh, empiric uh, study and uh, uh, tried to uh, persuade uh, readers that the uh, behavior of voters is more irrational. And uh, it is not so rational as public choice tried to explain uh, behavior of voters and so on. Uh, I try to explain to my students that uh, it is not uh, on the contrary. And uh, for example, Einstein's, uh, Albert Einstein's theory of relativity only extended and enriched Newton's law of motion for limit states for some special situations. It is very similar. Buchanan's theory of public choice and racial ignorance was extended and enriched by Brian Kaplan with his theory of uh, irrational public choice, uh, with his theory of uh, irrational behavior of voters. It is enrichment, it is not against. And second, uh, <coughs> second uh, remark uh, is, uh, uh, focus more to his new book. Uh, I, I gave uh, this uh, comics in English to my son. He's better in, in English than me uh, because uh, he's 15 and he's without some bad accent and bad pronunciation. Uh, 
and uh, I asked him, what do you think about this book? And uh, he told me, I read just two pages. Yeah, okay, I have to push a little bit him. Uh, some couple of days ago uh, died a uh, well-known, uh, world-known economist, uh, liberal economist and member of Montpellerin Society, uh, Antonio Martino. He was uh, awarded uh, 10, 12 years ago. He, he had an excellent presentation in our central bank maybe 15 years ago. Yeah. And uh, he said, it, is, it will be very free quotation, I am an absolute, absolute supporter of the free labor market. People who come here do not take wealth from us. On the contrary, they give it to us. They do not even take work and jobs, but they bring work and jobs to us. They increase our wealth. I think it is a very similar sentence as Brian Kaplan tried to uh, introduce in his book. But Antonio Martino added, However, as a minister of, in Berlusconi's cabinet, government, responsible with my carabinieri for the security of the Italian people, I am fundamentally opposed. <laughs> and it is my doubt, uh, we are a country, uh, slavery was not, uh, not very, uh, very uh, uh, big in my country. We were occupied, we were, we were uh, attacked by our neighbors from Germany, from Soviet Union, and so on. And uh, we don't feel so much this post-colonial post -colonial syndrome, this uh, guilty, as other countries, as the uh, United States maybe, maybe West European countries, and so on. We don't need uh, some different people here. We are, we are not racist. Now we have 300,000 refugees, war refugees from Ukraine here. They are mentally very close to us. They are cultural very close to us. They, they maybe will stay here and will work and will bring in the wealth. 300,000, it's more, it's three times more than was refugee wave in Germany 2015. Wir schaffen das. Yeah, wir schaffen das. But uh, we want in this country people which want to work. Then your theory about open borders will in order, will in function, and I will <laughs> clap my hands. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I welcome once more uh, my hero in economics. Brian Kaplan, welcome to Prague. Enjoy this evening. Uh, you, will, you will be awarded by the annual award of a liberal institute. I don't have, unfortunately. Uh, I wish you this, this award. And um, uh, I, am, I look forward for your presentation, for your views, and maybe for understanding our doubts in this issue. Thank you very much, and enjoy. Not, ju not just yet. <laughs> so, uh, President, Prime Minister, Professor Kaplan, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Libera Liberal Institute annual lecture. This idea of annual lectures started, as President Schwartz said, in the 1990s. The first two were held by Gary Becker and Milton Friedman. So far, we've had 24 annual lectures. This one is the 25th. The last two, Tom Palmer and David Friedman, were held online because of the coronavirus pandemic. So the last one we held in person was in May 2019, and that was uh, the uh, lecture, giving the lecture was Daniel Hannan, now Lord Hannan, uh, you know him well, I, th I think. And uh, so after three years, we finally uh, are excited to welcome so many of you here to one of our longest running traditions 
the annual lectures. Ever since I was in college, uh, incidentally, the dean back then <laughs> was the President Schwarz. Uh, in our university, Ryan Kaplan was one of the economists we students talked, uh, talked about a lot. Uh, his ideas are controversial and were controversial then, but reading through his books or blog posts or uh, academic articles, by the end of the text, I find myself agreeing with Professor Kaplan most of, most of the time, almost always. And when I thought I couldn't possibly agree with him more, I found out that he, just like me, likes Gilmore Girls. <laughs> Brian Kaplan is the author of many interesting and revolutionary, dare I say, intellectual concept, concepts, like the ideological Turing test, or rational, irra rational irrationality, idea trap, and many more. We could host an annual lecture based on any of these or any of his books. He now has five books out, if I, if I count that correctly. The Myth of the Rational Voter, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids, The Case, the case Against Education, Open Borders, and now the newest one, Labor Econ versus the World. And many more are coming. We talked about the books in our podcast, so when it becomes available over the weekend, be sure to listen to it. Uh, Brian Kaplan is a professor of economics at George Mason University, a research fellow at the Mercatus Center, a young scholar at the Cato Institute, and a former contributor to the Free Economics blog and to Econlog. He now has a, a new blo blog platform called Bedonet, and uh, you can uh, talk about it uh, later if, if you want. He is a self-described economic libertarian and an anarcho-capitalist. In my years in college, uh, one, of, one of his works that, we, that was especially controversial for us was his paper, Why I Am, Why I Am Not an Austrian Economist. Of course, uh, we, when we were in college, we were all Austrians, and uh, we couldn't understand how, 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 uh, how uh, uh, Professor Kaplan can betray us like this. <laughs> But the topic of the lecture today is open borders, the science and ethics of immigration. We published this book last summer, the Czech uh, translation, and uh, the official launch was on September the 1st. But now finally we will hear from the author himself. Professor Kaplan was also kind enough to write a Czech introduction specifically for the Czech edition. And he will of course be happy to sign uh, your copies after the lecture if you already uh, had them or if you buy them here uh, in the next room. The topic of open borders and immigration became much more immediate and much more important for us here in the Czech Republic in the last month. Uh, we agreed on the date and on the topic of the talk long before Putin's barbaric war in Ukraine, but because of it, the topic of the lecture and the lecture itself could not be more apt. The format of the rest of the evening will be as follows. Uh, Professor Kaplan will give his lecture, then we will have a Q&A session for about half an hour or maybe a little longer if there are many interesting questions. Uh, then we will have the official formal uh, uh, annual prize award and then I will invite you to an informal discussion in the next room with some refreshments. So without further ado, I give the floor to Professor Brian Kaplan. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. It's hard to live up to that, but I'm going to try. Let's see, why don't we just uh, advance to the next slide? All right, uh, <clears throat> so let me start with the social value of labor mobility, something that many people here in Czechia will understand. How many people here have ever gone to another country to work? Raise your hand. All right, so this is not unfamiliar to you then. How many people here are not from Prague? All right, great. All right, so we now have a common experience. All right, in free labor markets, workers tend to move from places where wages are low to places where wages are high. This is something that we see all around the world. It is the normal state of affairs. People in low wage areas look and they say, there's some place with higher wages, why don't I go there and then I too can earn these higher wages. Obviously, this benefits the workers themselves. That's why they're going. You move from one place to another to get a raise, right? But 
This is hardly the only effect. These are not the only beneficiaries. When the people here moved to another place, yes, you gained, you got a better job, but there was something else that happened. What? Well, you wound up increasing the productivity of the world. You were an important part of a transformation of the entire production of humanity. By moving from one place to another, you made the production of the world higher. Why would this be so? Well, because normally wages and productivity are very closely linked. There's a reason why Tom Cruise makes $30 million a movie, right? If Tom Cruise says, I don't want to be in your movie, that destroys the movie. Whereas if the extra, the person in the back who pours Tom Cruise's character's coffee says, hey, I don't want to be in the movie, you just replace him with someone else, right? His, product, his contribution to the movie is a lot lower, right? Because wages and productivity are closely linked, uh, we see workers that earn low wages normally do not produce so much. Workers that earn high wages usually produce a lot. What this means is that when one of you move from a lower wage place to a higher wage place, you are not just enriching yourself. You are rather increasing the productivity of the world. You're increasing the amount of wealth that you produce for society, right? As if by an invisible hand, to use an expression you've probably heard before. The individual sees I can make more money, but what society sees is production is now greater than it would have been. Important to notice, this holds equally for high and low skilled workers. It could be Tom Cruise moving to another country in order to make even more money on a movie. But it could also be a camera crew moves from one country to another. It could be the janitors or the food service people that move from one country to another. In all of these cases, people move to do better for themselves, but when they move, they wind up producing more for humanity. Uh, now, it's very easy to see this in an industry like agriculture. There you can actually see that a Ukrainian farmer producing under primitive conditions can move to a Czech farm run by modern agribusiness, and suddenly the same person could be growing 10 times as much food per year. Very easy to see that. Same for manufacturing. If someone is working in very primitive manufacturing conditions, then they move to an advanced modern factory, suddenly they're producing a lot more stuff for the world while earning a higher wage for themselves. The one case where it's harder to understand the productivity gain is for services. Like you might say, well look, shining shoes in Haiti is the same as shining shoes in Miami. Where is the productivity gain? Or cutting hair seems to be the same in both countries. The technology is the same, is it not? The important thing to remember is the whole point of a service is to save time. And when you save the time of a person whose wage is higher, you have contributed more to the world by doing that. If you save five minutes of Bill Gates' time, you do a lot more for the world than you would save five minutes of my time because Bill Gates does so much more per minute with his life than I do, despite all the great compliments, which I really appreciate. All right, uh, next slide, yes. All right, now normally when we think about this, we are picturing migration within a country. We're picturing people moving from farm towns to cities. There almost everyone, when they calm down, can see, ah, there's actually a great gain for the world when, say, Chinese farmers move from their villages into cities or into port areas, then they become part of the modern economy and they contribute so much more. But the logic is still totally sound across national borders. When workers move from, to higher wages in a different country, they're also enriching the world. Again, if you're having trouble understanding what the process is, a question I often ask Americans, so you're familiar with the country of Haiti? You've heard of Haiti? It is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. How much could you do with your life if you were trapped in Haiti? If you showed up in Haiti and they took away your passport and they said, here's your Haitian passport, we don't have any record you were ever in any other country, how much could you accomplish? Well, it would probably be very hard because Haiti is messed up in so many different ways. Right? So you could take a high productivity person, but if they were stuck in Haiti, this would mean that there would be a great reduction in their contribution that they can make to the global economy. Uh, in my book, I have a thought experiment where I say, imagine that there are people who are farming in Antarctica. You're farming in Antarctica. You're just barely surviving, just growing just enough food to stay alive. 
Right. Now, what would happen if another country, say Argentina, said, you are allowed to come to Argentina. In Argentina, life will be better for you. What would happen? Well, obviously, those Antarctic farmers would go, to Argent- would go to Argentina. They'd almost certainly like the deal. They would produce more food. And are they going to consume all the extra food themselves? Of course not. Instead, most of the extra food they will sell to the rest of the world, which then does not just benefit the Argentinian farmers, well, the formerly Antarctican farmers, or the Argentinian Antarctican farmers. Uh, now it benefits everybody on Earth who eats because food is more abundant and cheaper. All right, which now brings us to the big question. All right, every first world country strictly, re- strictly limits immigration. What is the point of these restrictions? What does they accomplish? And the answer is the whole point of the restrictions is to stop economically beneficial migration from happening. To say, yes, you want to move from a low productivity place to a high productivity place. No, you cannot. Stay where you are. Doesn't matter how little you accomplish there. That is where you are going to remain. You are not allowed to move to a higher productivity place. That is the whole point of the laws. To trap labor where it started even though the person wants to move and even though this would be more productive for the world. Now, one question that people will occasionally raise is maybe the laws don't actually change anything. Maybe it's like the mask laws now where you see a bunch of signs saying everyone has to wear a mask, but yeah, I don't see anyone wearing a mask. All right, freedom, yes. All right, (laughs) and humanity, right? But in any case, uh, you could imagine that immigration restrictions don't actually change human behavior. I have met smart people in America who tell me this. All right, they say, look, there's already 11 million illegal immigrants here. Obviously, we have open borders already. The laws don't matter. All right, can't believe you would say this. All right, so how do we know this is totally wrong? Well, we have many ways to know it's totally wrong, but the simplest one is just to look at black market smuggling prices. All right, the cheapest country to get into the United States from is Mexico. A typical smuggling fee would be about $4,000. This is about three years wages for a rural Mexican worker. Would someone pay three years of income to do something that is free? Has anyone here ever paid three years of income to do something free? Right? It would be like, oh, it's free ice cream, but I work for three years to pay for it. Right? That would be a crazy thing for a person to do. No one is going to do that. Right? So that's one very strong sign. And of course, from other countries, the costs of getting in illegally are even higher from a country like Pakistan could easily be $75,000. It's even more extreme than that because often people do not succeed. Uh, The business in Mexico actually is so developed they often have a money back guarantee where uh, they'll say, we'll just try as many times as it takes to get you in. So it's an advanced model, but that's only for the very thick market. All right, another proof we have of how important the laws actually are, the United States has a bizarre immigration policy. We actually have an immigration lottery. We have an immigration lottery where people can apply to a lottery and then about one person in 100 wins and gets to come to the United States. All right, uh, there are important restrictions on this, law, on this lottery such as It is only for people from countries that do not send a lot of immigrants to the United States. So China, India, and Mexico are all banned from the lottery. All right, so I think you guys are probably okay. Anyone ever get into the U.S. on on the lottery? All right, so I mean, in the U.S., you meet them, actually. Uh, But anyway, uh, out of the people that win, about 80% come, right? And yet we're only letting in about 1%. So if you do the math, you realize that If you just said everyone wins, you're all winners. You're all winners. This would let in about 23 million immigrants into the US the first year. All right, this is about 23 times what we let in in a typical year. All right, so again, obviously the laws matter a lot. Finally, there are also international surveys which show that over a billion people would like to move to another country to work. So yes, that's very clear. All right, so anyway, the laws actually matter and they matter enormously. All right, now what do these restrictions accomplish? What do these restrictions accomplish? Uh, Well, 
Um, since I have already conceded that the laws actually matter a lot, they reduce immigration a lot. Right? I am very happy to admit that. Immigration laws actually reduce immigration. They reduce them by an enormous amount. But what are the actual effects of this? Well, the first and largest one is that immigration restrictions impoverish mankind. Immigration restrictions impoverish mankind. There's a standard estimate that, uh, that we owe to economist Michael Clemens. Uh, he went through the math and said, a good guess is that in a world where anyone could work anywhere, the GDP of the earth would double. Right? We don't even have a well-accepted label for this, but you can call it GWP, Gross World Product. This is the biggest economic number in the world by definition. Right? Gross World Product is everything that is produced on earth. And his estimate is you could take everything being produced on earth right now and double it if anyone could move anywhere. This is why Michael Clemens subtitled the article, Trillion Dollar Bills on the Sidewalk. Trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk. That would be like, what, like 25 million. Sorry, I forgot the name of the check money. Kroll. Oh, oh, that's easy. Yeah, much easier than in Poland. All right, it's like 25 trillion krona bills. Uh, that would be pretty amazing. And you know, this is like not inflated, like actual, like real value of 25 trillion. All right, it's a big number, obviously. All right now, the, the, the backstory behind this example, uh, there's an old economic slogan that says there are no $20 bills on the sidewalk, right? And the idea is that if a $20 bill were on the sidewalk, someone would see it and they would pick it up and that it wouldn't be there. Therefore, if you think you have seen a $20 bill, you are wrong. Your eyes deceive you, it's fake. All right. I spent about 35 years without ever finding a $20 bill on the sidewalk. And then I walked outside my office in the economics department and I saw a $20 bill, $20 on the sidewalk. I actually did look around. I said, is there a hidden camera to see if an economist will just ignore it? It's like, no, it must be fake, an illusion. All right, I, it was real, but I mean, it's, and then one other time in the, by the, in the grocery store parking lot, I found $40, All right, but anyway. Still, twice in a lifetime did this happen to me. All the other times that that money fell, someone else picked it up first. So if $20 bills could not be found on the sidewalk, how could there be trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk, as this math says? And the answer is that it only takes one person to notice $20 bills on the sidewalk to pick up the $20. One person sees it, he reaches down, he picks it up. But to pick up the trillion dollar bills of free migration, you must convince a country of something. Now, normally at this point in my talk, I say, has anyone here ever convinced a country of anything? But actually, maybe. All right. Oh, the, every other audience, everyone says, no, I have not convinced a country of anything. All right, we now have one person who has convinced a country of something, but was it easy? <laughs> was it easy to convince a country of something? No, it's not easy to convince countries a thing. I, I've never convinced a country of anything so far yet. That's the idea, is there's enormous gain if you can convince a country, but convincing a country is extremely hard. Now, if you want to understand a little bit more about why is the number so big, what's going on is that we start with one big number, namely, how much does it multiply productivity of an average migrant when he moves from a poor country to a rich country? And there, it would be something like five times, right? Not 5% more, not 50% more, times five. As people in the tech sector will say, it's 5X, 5X, man. All right, so 5X. All right, so we can multiply productivity five times, and then we, then we take that and we multiply it by another really big number, the number that would like to move to work. And that is at least a billion. All right, so you take those two numbers, a big gain in productivity per worker times an enormous number of people want to move. When you multiply one large number times another large number, you get an astronomical number, and that is 25 trillion krona on the sidewalk. Move forward. All right. Um, now, here is something that is quite striking. There are a lot of pro-immigration authors in the world, and almost none of them say any of the things I just told you. It's really true. 
Most pro-immigration people never mention any of these things. It's like, that's a strange thing to not say. To not say that we could double the, G, the, the gross world product, right? Instead, you're talking about Albert Einstein, Sergey Brin, great men, but you know, they didn't double the production of the world, right? They did great things. All right, now most people who analyze immigration policy ignore almost everything that, I, almost everything that I've told you. Right? And in particular, even very pro-immigration authors usually just focus on high school immigration. They go and tell a bunch of stories about particular amazing immigrants. Like Tesla. All right, think about the great Tesla or Elon Musk from South Africa. Right? Now, on the one hand, these are great stories of immigrants, great success stories. But on the other hand, it doesn't prove very much. Like, who would be against letting in Elon Musk? It's probably a few people who don't like his Twitter. But... Uh, it's like, oh yeah, great guy, but you know, bad Twitter, so keep him out, right? But anyway, uh, you, when you think about the most amazing immigrants in the world, of course, almost everybody wants to let them in, but it doesn't really make much of a case for letting in a regular computer programmer, much less a janitor. For that, you really do need to have a totally different argument, and my argument satisfies that and is also, as I said, correct. Uh, now, every now and then, though, there will be a person who will say, all right, fine, fine, we're, we can double the world production, but who cares? Like, who cares? Who cares about doubling the production of the world? It's like, well, like, basically all the gains will go to immigrants themselves, so what difference does it make? All right, now this is a strange reaction on many levels. One of them is that often the same person speaking doesn't just do immigration policy, they also do development policy. And the whole point of development policy, of course, is to increase the riches of people born in poor countries. So it'd be odd to say you don't care about it when you're working as an immigration economist and then when you're working as a development economist to say you care a lot. But the deeper problem is this. We have a lot of historic, historical experience with large increases in production. We have things like the Industrial Revolution, the internet, vaccines. And in all of these cases, we can see that the gains were very broadly shared. The Industrial Revolution did not just benefit factory owners. It benefited all the people who could now afford to wear additional clothes, right? It really was true in the old days that people would only own one set of clothes, right? So let's see. The, in the origin of the English word robber comes from the German raub, uh, cloth, because the one thing that a robber would steal from you in the old days is they would just find you in, find a peasant in the forest and say, I'll kill you unless you give me your clothes, which might take a year's worth of labor to be able to afford. The Industrial Revolution comes along and suddenly a regular person can afford 10 sets of clothes. An enormous change, not just a benefit for the factory owner. Or the internet, did the internet just benefit computer programmers? Right, that's absurd. As we know, most of the internet is free. So how are they benefiting from it? Or take vaccines, did vaccines only benefit the pharmaceutical manufacturers? Yeah, last night I was actually looking up the profits that were earned by the main, ph by the main vaccine producers. So I believe that Moderna got $10 billion in 2021, $10 billion. What were the actual gains to the world of the vaccine? And let's see, let's count the health benefits, the reopening of the economy, the reduction in fear, count it all. Like trillions of gains, trillions. Moderna would be lucky to have gotten 1% of that. Instead, the gains were very broadly shared with a large number of people. This is the way that, that large increases in production normally work. The gains are not just enjoyed by the people that create them, but rather a lot of the surplus goes to others. Implication. Since immigration restrictions drastically reduce global production, they are almost certainly impoverishing us as well. Right now, many people will then say, oh, that's just trickle-down economics. You know the expression, trickle-down economics? This is like, well, the production goes up and then will be enjoyed by a lot of people. Oh, well, just a trickle, just a few drops. Like, you know, the pharmaceutical companies get almost everything and we just get a few little drops like getting to live another 30 years. That's it. All right. Um, now, uh, in the book, I say it's not trickle-down economics. 
Uh, let's see, I say it's Niagara Falls Economics. Have you guys heard of Niagara Falls? Yeah, so it's an amazing waterfall, one of the best in the world. Uh, it actually looks better from the Canadian side, but uh, Canada's been so crazy during COVID, you'll have to settle for the American side, perhaps. Uh, either way, it's, it's a great waterfall. Let's see, I've been asking people in Europe, what are the best waterfalls in Europe, and no one has any answers. And what's the best waterfall in Czechia? All right. Yeah. Look, you got mountains. You must have a good waterfall somewhere. I, I think you're selling yourself short. But anyway, uh, if we could move forward. Yes. So this is actually a panel from the book. Uh, if it's confusing, there was, an, in the older days, people would actually do something very stupid. They would go over Niagara Falls in a barrel to get attention. It really did happen. Many died, but some survived. And they said, see, I survived. Uh, now I'm a great man. But anyway. Uh, this is just art, so it's perfectly safe. All right, and the, fir and the panel says, so, you know, open borders, it's not trickle-down economics. It is what I call Niagara Falls economics, an enormous flood of wealth covering the world. All right, so what are we losing? Uh, tons of cheap products. Let's see, do you have Walmart here? No? Do you have Costco here? No? Well... Maybe Open Borders would bring you Walmart and Costco. <laughs> uh, let's see. What's the best way to, you know, so like, like Costco is probably less well known in Europe than, than Walmart. Walmart, you probably at least have some idea. So Costco, if you've ever wondered, what are Americans doing in those big houses with their big cars? The answer is they are going to Costco and they are buying enormous quantities of incredibly cheap, high quality products which they put in their car and they drive them to their homes and their homes are large enough to contain these enormous and cheap high quality products. Let's see, so like during COVID I was buying like 20 pound blocks of beef, super high quality, very cheap per pound or per kilo, but, uh, you know. but anyway, if you can imagine this, imagine just being flooded with abundant, cheap, large, high quality products. Right, which of course could also include a whole lot of new construction so you would have much larger homes to live in to store these amazing products. See, my next nonfiction graphic novel is going to be on housing deregulation, by the way. So I am looking at every European city that I see and asking, where are your skyscrapers? Where are the skyscrapers? In Budapest, they've got almost nothing. Here in Prague, you're beating Budapest by a lot. But Warsaw is still crushing you. Warsaw is doing great. Skyscrapers, yes, we have the technology to build enormous amounts of living space in downtown cities and to re greatly reduce the cost of living, to re greatly reduce housing costs. Right? There's a lot more I can say, but uh, maybe I'll come back and talk to you about housing. But again, who's going to build all this housing? Again, that would be a great activity for migrants to do. All right, so tons of cheap products, also tons of cheap services. Uh, I've seen a lot of Bolt here. At least in Hungary, they were saying Bolt is almost all done by migrants. So I don't know if that's true here. But if you just think about all the other cheap services that you might like to enjoy that you currently don't, whether it's nannies or cleaning or gardening or what have you. Okay, uh, another one, uh, large, in uh, large increases in real estate values, at least in the short run. Right, so that's something else where when you have a large number of people that move in, that tends to raise real estate values. Uh, I was just doing an interview about this. It's like, well, isn't that a negative thing? It's like, well, you know, every change is negative for some people and positive for others. The right way to think about it is what is the total effect? What is the total effect? Right, you know, COVID vaccines have been terrible for morticians. Right, so you know about morticians, right? You know the word, yes, <laughs> All right, so it's like, yes, before I was making all this money from all these people dying and now this stupid vaccine ruined my business. All right, well, this is the kind of thing where you need to step back and say, what is the overall effect? Rather than looking for someone that's lost because you'll always find someone that loses from any kind of progress. Yes, when I'm talking to my American students, I, will, I say, yes, there are some people who lost from the end of communism like KGB agents, oh, ruined their whole plan, their whole career. Well, not all KGB agents, as we know, but uh, <laughs> many of them, <laughs> many of them. <laughs> all right, 
Uh, another big economic change is the rise in entrepreneurship and innovation. Again, here it's easy to talk about Elon Musk or Sergey Brin, but it's important to remember that a lot of entrepreneurship is not high skilled. It's just someone who has some different skills from natives who sees a market and makes his dream happen. Right? When, you, when I walked around Prague today, I saw so many different ethnic restaurants from so many different countries. And the odds are that each of these restaurants was started by a migrant. Each of them had a business idea. Said, hey, I think that Czechs might like to eat Vietnamese food. Right? Those of you who remember the communist period, I'm assuming, were there any Vietnamese restaurants in Prague under communism? I'm guessing no. Yeah, there was one, all right. Well, one, but many people never even heard about it. All right, and yet, as a result of migration, some Vietnamese came here and said, hey, maybe they would like my food, a food they'd never heard of, but they will hear of it and they will love it, or at least some of them. And that's the story of each of these restaurants. These are not PhDs that are starting restaurants. They're just people who have different skills from natives and vision. And you put those together and we get progress. All right now, of course, there's a standard question. What about the effect on native wages and jobs? Well, there is the abstract answer and there's the more specific answer. The abstract answer, as I was saying, is that all progress helps some people and hurts other people. Right, so uh, whether or not an immigrant is good or bad for you depends upon whether the immigrant produces what you produce or produces what you, cons what you consume. It is bad for me when the United States admits more economics professors. They are people that actually are competing with me for the same jobs. If we would expel every foreign born economist from America, I could probably get a better job. All right, but that's only one part of the picture. What about all the immigrants that produce what I consume? Everyone who runs a restaurant, everyone who produces housing, everyone who grows food. All of them, they're not competing with me. When an Afghan immigrant shows up and opens a restaurant, I don't say, oh no, maybe I'm gonna have trouble getting a raise this year. Instead, it's the opposite. Instead, that immigrant gives me a raise because he makes my money worth more by offering me a new service that I want to buy. Because remember, the whole point of money is to spend it on things that you actually want. All right, which means that we should always focus on the net effect. Don't just focus on immigrant competition for your job. Also think about immigrant competition for your krona, right? And think about the general picture, all right? Now, when you put this all together, in the, with this, you say, well, what would the net effect be? Well, overall, you should expect that a large majority of people will be net gainers in the same way that a large majority of people were net gainers from the Industrial Revolution or the internet or vaccines. Because in all these cases, we have a large increase in production, which means that on balance, living standards are going up. There's always a chance that you are in the minority that does not benefit. Although again, when the benefits are in many different industries at once, the odds that you will be losing out overall is very low. But again, there are no guarantees in life. Remember those morticians that are suffering now because of COVID vaccines. All right, now finally, if you think that natives should get even more of the gains, there is a simple way to make that happen. And that is to say immigrants are welcome, but as the British say, certain terms and conditions apply. Certain terms and conditions apply. So you could let them in and say, fine, you can come, but there's an admission fee. You have to pay some money to come in. Or you could say you can come in, but we're going to charge you higher taxes than natives. Right? And precisely because the gains and productivity are so large, you can actually charge a high price for admission and still get many people that are very happy to come because it's such a good deal. If Haitians heard you can come to America, but you have to pay 10 percentage points higher taxes, the reaction is going to be, that's it? Uh, yes, yes. Before you change your mind, yes. That would sound great. All right. And then you could take this money that you raise and use it to help any natives that happen to lose out. I'm not saying this is fair. I'm just saying that if you happen to think that natives should get an even larger share of the gains, there's a simple way to make this happen. Uh, so why not? Why not? Uh, well, I can tell you I've been talking about this issue for many years, and estimates of massive gains very rarely change people's minds. Right? Why not? Well, one big answer is most people don't do math at all. 
Most people are completely bored by numbers and have no interest in them. That's why when you watch an American presidential debate, there's almost no math. There's almost never a time when someone says, hey, I thought you said that the amount of money being spent was 393 billion. Show me the math. It's like, great. Let me pull up my PowerPoint slides. I'll explain all the math. That's not what happens in debates. It's just too boring for people. Most people approach issues emotionally, as I said in my first book. All right, but uh, there are people who do think numerically, people who do use math, and when they go over the numbers, normally they will actually say, all right, fine, fine, double GWP, all right. But, all right now, I'm kind of puzzled, like, how, what's, what's gonna follow? Like, we double GWP, but, like, this would be like a, per, you know, you tell a person, all right, yes, you've just won a billion dollars, but, it's like, what's gonna come next? You know, but, you have to give up your right arm? Like, what will be after that preposition? All right. So anyway, uh, normally what people say is, yes, we can have this enormous increase in global production, but we have some offsetting concerns. Now, in the q and I'm happy to talk about other ones, but let me just talk about the main ones. First big one is protecting native taxpayers. Second big one is protecting native culture. And third one is protecting native liberty. All right, now for all of these, what I want to do is to see how serious they are, in particular, to never forget the math, to never forget the math. So I'm gonna tell you is actually very pessimistic stories about these could be true, and yet the, number, the amount of the gain is so large that it would still be on balance a good idea. Right now, I do think the complaints are at best greatly exaggerated, but even there, even if you're not convinced, I'll still say, look, Think about this in terms of the numbers, right? Because let me just give you a really easy math problem. Uh, one trillion minus one billion is approximately equal to, you know, the approximation sign, it's the squiggly equal sign. A trillion minus a billion approximately equals a trillion, because a billion is a rounding error compared to a trillion, right? And yet in a debate, it's very common for me to give a trillion dollar argument and then hear a bunch of billion dollar rebuttals and I do want to say, look, suppose you're all right, I still win, right? Not in the eyes of the audience, unfortunately, because the emotional, sto the emotional aspect of the stories matters a lot more than the facts. Once I was actually invited to the big national anti-immigration conference in the United States, um, later in the day, there actually was a panel of people whose family had family members murdered by illegal immigrants. All right, I would not have been on that panel. But what is the argument really? It's like, well, so suppose that we had a panel of people whose relatives were murdered by Jews. Does this show we should do something bad to Jews? Right, or family members murdered by Czechs. Let's never let anyone who's Czech into the country again because we found five people who were murdered by, who had a family member murdered by someone from Czechia. It's a terrible argument and yet emotionally ultra effective, of course. All right, so how serious are these objections? All right, so let's start with protecting taxpayers. Now, I know U.S. numbers best. All right, uh, so I, and I honestly say I have not looked at numbers for Czechia. Um, I have heard, actually, that in Czechia that non-EU members are not eligible for most welfare benefits. This is true? This is true? All right, well, then your numbers are going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> that really helps a lot to get the numbers good. All right. But anyway, here's a, here's a simple story, um, especially clear in the U.S. Um, so let me just tell you how much money the American government was giving people during COVID. If you lost your job due to COVID, the American government gave you about $40,000 per year. Yeah, so that is, gee, what is that in Krona? Uh, let's see, well, four times 2.5 is 10. So yes, yes, so yeah. So yeah, that's a million krona per year not to work. Right, that, you know, so that was the most egregious the US welfare state ever became. But you know, don't say we don't have a welfare state, people. Whatever else you say, the US totally does have a welfare state. All right, so now obviously, this is more money than many countries pay to work. Right? And then the implication that many Americans draw is obviously many people will come to abuse the system. All right, so, well, uh, possibly. But 
Uh, it is important again to go and actually do the math. Now, doing the math for the for the net fiscal effect of an immigrant is actually extremely complicated. You need to do things like say, all right, the very first year they're probably going to be earning very little. They may be getting some special adjustment benefits, but then afterwards they'll start earning. Then they'll work for a certain number of years, their kids will go to school, they'll retire, their kids will pay some taxes. These are all the kinds of things that people who are doing this accounting think about. What's striking is that almost everyone has a strong opinion about this math, even people who have never even thought about the complexity of it. Right? And you can predict what people will think about the math very quickly by just saying, how do you feel about immigrants emotionally? People like immigrants say, oh yeah, the math is great. People don't like immigrants, the math is terrible. It's like, wow, I'm, I, it must be great to be able to do math with emotions alone because it's never worked for me. Right? When I've been in a math test, I've always said, calm down. I can't just, I won't solve this problem by getting angry at it. All right, but uh, here are some factors that really do help tip the scales in favor of immigrants. Uh, first fact, which is true of not just the U.S. welfare state, but all ones that I know about, uh, most of the money actually goes to the old rather than the poor, and immigrants tend to be young, right? which means that actually immigrants help very often to make the, make the welfare state more sustainable rather than less. Uh, in the U.S., there's almost no serious researcher that finds a big negative overall fiscal effect of immigration. Uh, there's a recent report by the National Academy of Sciences, very prestigious, very quantitative, very boring, and therefore very useful for my purposes. And what they find is the immigrants that the US admits now are a net positive. They do find some negative groups, like elderly immigrants, very low-skilled immigrants, but still overall a positive. Now again, if it just seems too good to be true to think that immigrants could be a fiscal positive for any country of the welfare state, uh, something important to remember is that a lot of government spending is what we call non-rival. This means the cost does not depend upon population. Right, so for national defense, for example, if you had a whole lot of babies, right, would you then say we need more tanks to protect the babies? Right, no, like you can protect the babies just as well with whatever military that you currently have. Uh, so you know, it is something where additional people spread the cost of national defense rather than multiplying it. Okay. All right, now finally, even if this complaint were true, even if it really were the case that immigrants were in some countries a drain in the welfare state, and I think there's little doubt that there are some countries where they are, the obvious question is, well, why not change your laws so that they are free to live and work but not to receive benefits? Why is it that people that are worried about immigration don't take all of their energy they currently put into keep them out and put it in to limit their benefits? It seems like a much more modest request, and yeah, you guys have done it, right? I'm, I'm curious, I need to learn more, so I need to learn all the details about exactly what you're doing so I can use this in future talks. Uh, so yes. Uh, now countries that, are, that I know do this are the Gulf monarchies, right? So the Gulf monarchies, people come there to work, they are going to, if you try, try to go on benefits, they probably just aren't eligible at all. Right? And this is, why, this is a big part of the reason why they are so happy having large amounts of immigrants there, including those good immigrants. It's not just petroleum engineers in the United Arab Emirates. They let in nannies. They let in janitors, right? Because they know that they are there to work. Now, doesn't this mean that it's terrible for the nannies and janitors? No. They're coming because they can make five times as much money in the United Arab Emirates as they can in Pakistan. That's the gain, right? All right. <clears throat> All right, then there is the protection of culture. Um, you may think that it's funny that Americans want to protect our culture because you may say Americans don't really have a culture. All right, uh, Americans believe they have a culture anyway. Uh, whatever, whatever, it is, you know, whatever, whatever the, the truth of the matter is, Americans feel like they've got a culture and they want to protect it. Definitely my dad, who's 83, feels like his culture that he grew up in in the 1950s has been greatly damaged. I don't think he could really seriously claim it was mostly immigrants. The problem is young people messed it up by changing, right? Because if you think my 83-year-old father is happy with the state of American culture, you're wrong. Uh, he is not happy. All right, but anyway, this complaint says that immigrants come and they destroy our culture. They won't learn English. They don't fit in. 
The problem with cultural objections is that many of them are hard to measure, which means that it makes sense to start with the ones that we can measure. We can easily measure, and we have measured language acquisition. And here is what we know. First-generation immigrants to the U.S. who come as adults very rarely achieve fluency. Today, they also very rarely achieve fluency 100 years ago. It is not true that immigrants used to learn English perfectly and now they don't. Rather, the story is that first-generation immigrants, it's just hard for an adult to learn a new language perfectly. However, both today and in the past, we see that second-generation immigrants, the children of immigrants, do learn English almost perfectly. Right? And that continues to be true. Right. All right. Uh, now, uh, some people uh, have complaints about trust. There's a whole social science literature on this. Um, if you're curious about it, uh, you could read hundreds and hundreds of articles about it. Uh, the main thing to know about trust is that, uh, first of all, it does seem like migrating to the first world immediately raises trust somewhat. Uh, the way that you feel about people depends upon the people that you are around. If you're in a war zone, it makes sense to be untrusting. If you're in a peaceful country, it makes sense to trust people more. But what we also see is that there's high assimilation of trust. The children of immigrants come to be very similar in trust to the people in the country where they grow up. Another very important thing to understand about culture and immigration. Uh, there is an argument which is not wrong that says, look, there have been big changes in the technology of transportation and the technology of communication. When a migrant came to the United States from Sicily 100 years ago, it is quite like, uh, like he really had no choice but to assimilate because he was probably never going to go home. Transportation was too expensive. He was never going to place a phone call. He might write a letter. But that's really when you showed up in the United States in the old days, you were almost completely cutting your ties with your home country. You had a strong reason to try to fit in in your new country. Due to changes in transportation and communication, these incentives are much weaker today. Right? So I have a friend who has a wife from Taiwan, and at the end of every day, her kids ask, so mom, how was Taiwan today? because she just watches Taiwanese news, she talks to a bunch of relatives in Taiwan, right? she reads news about Taiwan, she doesn't really think that much about the country that she's in. She's very unassimilated in that way. All right, so, so far it is true that, the, that in some ways transportation and communication have changed so that assimilation is less essential, but there's another way in which they have made assimilation much easier. How? Well. How is it that I'm having this conversation with you guys? How is it that you're understanding me? Because you guys speak English. A right? hundred years ago, how many people in Prague would have spoken English? Probably almost nobody would have spoken English in those days. What happened? Well, we had big improvements in communication and transportation technology, which made it much easier and more beneficial to you to learn English. And so now you know, as do a great many other people in this country. Um, one of my students who's given this a name, he calls this pre-assimilation, assimilating before you actually migrate, which would have been very rare in the past, but now anyone in this room could move to an English-speaking country and probably get a job in your occupation. You wouldn't need to do what my father-in-law did. He was from Romania. When he showed up in the United States, he didn't speak any English. He had to work as a janitor for a few years before his English was good enough to work in his regular occupation as an electrician. Right? But you guys are all so assimilated already that you're, that you're already prepared for life in another country, even if you haven't lived there. Now, finally, even if these com cultural complaints were true, why not admit anyone who passes an, a language fluency exam or a test of cultural literacy or what have you? Right now, by the way, so in the book, I talk about this issue quite a bit more. Uh, there are really two very different pictures that you get about the speed of assimilation of migrants. There's a picture you get from the media where basically assimilation is not only not happening, it's happening in reverse, where children of, uh, children of doctors are joining ISIS, that kind of thing. That's the kind of thing you put on the news. Why do you put it on the news? Because it's horrifying, gets people scared, they pay attention to it. Do you put things on the news because they are a fair statistical representation of reality? No. If it was a fair statistical representation of reality, it would be boring, no one would watch. You put things that are horrifying, right? This is true in all countries that I know, 
Right now, this is not saying that the news is lying to you, rather that it's just incredibly misleading. I mean, if you just look at the news, like all day, every day, everything is terrible, right? Can that really be the world? All day, every day, everything's terrible, right? That doesn't fit your experience. So why this gap? The, gap, the reason is the media is looking for the worst things in the world and then they put them in front of the camera and they show everybody to ruin everyone's day. All right, <laughs> all right. now what's another way you can get a picture of assimilation? Well, my advice is go and talk to immigrant parents about their kids. I have never met an immigrant parent who said, oh yeah, it's so great, my kid's barely assimilated at all, he only cares about my culture, you know, my grandkids speak my language perfectly, everything's fine. Instead, immigrant parents almost always have a lot of complaints about how much their kid is assimilated. And I'll say that's a much better measure of how much assimilation is going on than the news, which is really designed to be super misleading. All right, uh, this is one of my favorite pictures in the book. Uh, there are many people on the internet who do not like me, and one of the reasons not to like me is that I believe in magic dirt. Magic dirt. What is magic dirt? Well, they said, look, Brian is so stupid that he believes that you can take an illiterate Afghan goat herder, put him on a plane, and the second that his foot touches the soil of America, you know, like that, then suddenly, ah, he is transformed into a perfectly literate, fluent in English investment banker. All right, so this is the view that they attribute to me, and I'll say, look, I don't believe that, actually. I don't believe in magic dirt. Say, but I do believe in something that is almost as magical as magic dirt. Say, this is magic culture. All right, what does magic culture do? Well, it does one thing that's a little bit magical and another thing that really is quite magical indeed. The thing that's a little bit magical is that we really can take an illiterate Afghan goat herder, bring him to the United States, and he can very quickly become a productive member of society. How? He can wash dishes in an Afghan restaurant. He doesn't need to learn English. He just goes to the restaurant, gets a job, he washes dishes, he contributes. All right? Probably over time he learns English and he can get a better job. But anyway, you can get a person from a very backwards, culturally distant place, and you can still give them a job that they can do. Now, the really amazing thing, though, is what happens to the children of the illiterate Afghan goat herder. And that is, they grow up in the country and they assimilate almost totally, something that in the United States you can see very well. Uh, my wife speaks Romanian with an American accent, not English with a Romanian accent, right? And she showed up when she was seven, right? So this is something where if you ever go to the United States and you meet people with Czech last names, you might be amazed. Wow, they don't seem very Czech. So yeah, well, their ancestors came here a few generations ago. Why would they still be Czech? Like, well, like, is, is, is not in the blood? Well, a little is in the blood, but most of it is in the culture. Most of it is actually in the culture. All right, and if you take a look up there, that's actually a picture of Uncle Sam baptizing a baby. So he goes in with white baptismal clothes and he comes out red, white, and blue. So I, I like that. All right, <laughs> all right, moving on. All right, then finally there is protecting native liberty. All right, there's the idea that countries are rich because they are free, countries are poor because they're not free. The reason why countries have these policies is probably because the people in free countries believe in freedom, the countries in the unfree countries believe in not freedom. So when you move from a poor country to a rich country, there's the danger that you are bringing your poisonous political ideology with you. This is the idea of, look, what happened to Venezuela? Well, there's a lot of terrible socialist ideas in Venezuela. And does seeing that your country collapse teach you that the ideas are false? Some people. Some people just say, oh wow, it's, Maduro is so corrupt that he couldn't even make socialism work, even though we all know it's the best system. He's such a bad man that he made the best idea in the world fail. Right, that's another view that you might have. So you could move to the United States and vote for the very same policies that caused you to run away from the country because you don't believe in that theory. All right, so the very popular among both conservatives and libertarians to say, look, immigrants come from status countries and will eagerly vote to ruin our country too. Right, so you might say, gee, like we don't want to let in people from communist countries or former communist countries, right, because they will be poisoned with the ideas. All right, and by the way, there is actually interesting research suggesting that communism does have long-term intellectual poisoning effects. 
Uh, there is a really neat paper by Alessina and Fuchs Schindeln where they show that people who grew up in former East Germany are more socialist in adulthood, even controlling for everything about their income, their jobs, their situation in life. It's like you grow up in East Germany and then you say, okay, well, it's a noble idea that was pushed too far. Well, it's a noble idea that was pushed too far, okay? All right, it wasn't a bad idea. It was just, you know, it's pushed a little bit too far. Very noble. Uh, we need to consider all of the good aspects of it. Let's see, do people in Czechia ever talk about the good parts of communism? Yeah. No. <laughs> yes, all right. So anyway, um, so, you know, the, this is something at least to think about, right? And like, you know, if, uh, you know I remember, you know, so Tyler Cowen, he did spoke in, speak in former East Germany, said that, you know, he never met anyone in East Germany who was just a completely staunch anti-socialist. He never met anyone there who just said, look, you know, I don't like anything that even smells a little bit like socialism. Nine. All right. Instead, it was a lot of this, well... Had a lot of problems, it wasn't executed very well, and yes, we had bad malls or no malls, but on the other hand, something, something. <laughs> All right, so now, what can we say about this? Again, it's very important not just to speculate, but to look at what evidence that we have. So what I say is that the evidence shows the problem is at least greatly overstated. Uh, why? Well, first of all, uh, immigrants, even when they are allowed to vote, usually don't vote. They're not very interested in the politics of the country where they go to. So if you think they, they, that they vote badly, be happy that they vote rarely. All right, so that is one thing to say. All right, but something else that is worth pointing out, there's actually quite a bit of evidence that immigrants reduce native support for the welfare state because people do not like helping out groups. A lot of this research has been done in Scandinavia, where of course there's a lot of social scientists who both love the welfare state and they also like migration, but then they have these fears. You know, you know, you know. But maybe it could be the case that, uh, that Sweden will have a smaller a welfare estate because of all these uh, migrants coming, undermining our sense of a Swedish identity. Could this possibly uh, be? All right, <laughs> it's my generic Scandinavian accent. Doesn't fit, doesn't perfectly match any one country, but it's the whole area, it's exact. All right, but anyway. Um, now, this research, you uh, almost always say, says that the fear is true and that actually immigrants are undermining native support for the welfare state in countries with large welfare states. Um, now, if you are someone who loves both the welfare state and immigration, then this is a tough situation for you. On the other hand, if you're someone who is critical of the welfare state and favorable towards immigration, this is a case of killing two birds with one stone. We can get more of both things simultaneously. Uh, do you have a saying in Czech of killing two birds with one stone? All right, this is the first saying that I, that I, that I in English, that people have nodded to say, yes, we also have that saying. We, we have almost no overlap of sayings from what I've seen. <laughs> but anyway, this one we have, great. All right, now finally, even if the complaint were true, why not say that immigrants can come, they can work, they can live, but they can't vote? Why not that? All right, now the last thing that I wanna say is well, actually, a few things I want to say. But first one, uh, now, what exactly did I do in this book? What exactly did I do in this book? Did I do the thing where I went and I tried to find an expert that agreed with me on each, on, on each topic and then repeated that guy as if that was the definite truth? Uh, I'm going to say I did not do that. All right, so you can look at the references. There's a lot of references. All right, let's see. There's the references. Uh, what I, I did what I try to do whenever I write a topic. I try to read everything about the topic. I don't just read people that agree with me. I read people who disagree with me. And especially I look for the boring people. I look for the boring, narrow specialists who don't have any, who don't have any particular strong view emotionally. And I said, look, those are the people that I honestly trust the most. Yeah, like I don't, just, I don't trust a super pro-immigration person to give me the best numbers on the fiscal effect of immigration. I don't trust the really hostile person to do it either. The person I trust is the boring person, the accountant. The, these are the people that I consider most reliable. And when I wrote this book, I did try to go and figure out what is it that the boring people say about each narrow issue. Then how do I get this radical conclusion? Says, by combining all the boring facts into an interesting big picture. For each particular question, let's go and focus on the narrow facts. Then when we have all the facts in front of us, then let's see what they all mean. 
Anyway, so what I claim is in this book, I tried to rely upon mainstream social science. I'm not going and finding what some special libertarians think or some special pro-immigration people think. I'm trying to find what is it that normal, boring specialists think about each of these topics and bring it together. All right, of course, I would say that, right? That's why you have to read the book and decide whether I actually am doing what I claim to do. All right, but anyway, if my survey of the empirical evidence is even close to correct, then all leading moral theories are supportive of open borders. Right, so since this is continental Europe, you've probably heard of a number of philosophers, right? You probably, do they do philosophy in Czech high school? Yes, all right, yes, you actually learn Immanuel Kant and so on, David Hume, and, and, uh, and all right, so good, then you've got some background. All right, so these are the main moral theories that I talk about and where I say, let's look at the evidence through these different moral lenses. All right, well, uh, utilitarianism, this one's really easy. You know, maximize human happiness. Well, if you were doubling the production of the world and especially benefiting the poorest people, then obviously that is going to raise human happiness, almost, at least, almost certainly. All right, so that's a really easy case. And actually, I have met some very anti-immigration people who say, well, sure, if you're a utilitarian, then you're right. So, like, all right, well, it's a pretty big admission anyway. You know, utilitarianism is usually what social scientists start with anyway, so it's a pretty big admission. Uh, here's another one, uh, egalitarianism, especially as channeled through John Rawls. All right, so famous American philosopher who said that inequalities are only morally permissible if they benefit the very worst off people. And obviously the worst off people are going to be people born in dire poverty in poor countries. So again, it seems like egalitarianism leads to a very strong endorsement of open borders as well. All right, then you've got libertarianism, a philosophy with which some of you have some connection. All right. Uh, this is one where it seems obvious to me that this is the, that the open borders is the libertarian position. So look, so is the libertarian view that, you, that people should need government permission to live and work in a country or that you should not need government permission to live and work in a country? Hmm, let's see. So like, what's the libertarian view about barber licensing again? Should you need a license from the, from the government to cut hair or not according to libertarians? No, you should not need a piece of paper from the government to cut hair. It should be enough if there is a person who wants to cut hair and a person who wants their hair cut. That's it. That's all you need for this to be morally totally acceptable, or at least to be consistent with libertarian principles. All right? It would seem like the very same logic would apply for immigration. You know, if I want to go and hire an immigrant, should I need a piece of paper from the government saying that it's okay? No, I should not need a piece of paper from the government saying that's okay. It should be mine to do by right. Same for a landlord who wants to go and rent an apartment to an immigrant, right? All these cases, if someone wants to go and deal with them, it shouldn't be the government's business whether or not they happen to be born in the right place or have the right piece of paper. Uh, there is a strangely popular objection to this, which says, no, 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 immigrants are like trespassers. Immigrants are like trespassers. And the argument often goes, look, you're not free to move into my house without my permission. Therefore, immigrants should not be free to move into a country without the country's permission. All right. Hmm. Well, what else does this view imply? Let's see. Are you free to open a church in my house? According to libertarianism, should you be able to go and open up a church inside my house? Uh, no. Therefore, you should need government permission to open up a church in a country. It's the same argument. Uh, so should you be able to open up a store in my house without my permission? No, therefore, you should have to get government permission to open up a store in a country. Should you be, a should you be able to go and have an export-import business in my house without my permission? No, therefore, you should need government permission to export or import anything. All right. um, the point of all of this, if you actually took seriously this idea that you need, you'd have to have government permission to migrate into a country, you would not be a libertarian at all. You would be a socialist. You would be someone who says, look, the country's collective property, the citizens, nothing that the people oppose should ever happen. Right? That's a consistent position. Uh, it's not a libertarian position. All right, then there is economic efficiency. This is a little bit technical, but basically it comes down to let's maximize the dollar value social resources. It's very likely that doubling the production of the world will do that. 
Uh, then just other, other ones, uh, but meritocracy. Uh, in the United States, especially among conservatives, it's very popular to say, like, affirmative action is bad. Government should not force discrimination. The, we should hire the best person for the job. Right, so you know how there's a Supreme Court justice that's getting confirmed in the United States right now? Right, uh, Biden said something very unpopular. He said, I'm only gonna consider black women for this job. And most Americans said, no, you should consider, you should just get the best person without regard to race or gender. Right, so but anyway, Biden said, no, I'm gonna hire, I'm only looking at black women. All right, so um, now when you think about what immigration laws say, what do they say? Well, an employer wants to hire the best person for the job who might be Czech. And then the government says, no, no, you can only hire the best American for the job. You can't hire the best Czech because the Czech doesn't have the right piece of paper. All right, so if you really believe in meritocracy, if you think that, we should be, that you should be meritocratic and that you should base decisions upon what the individual person deserves, then again, open borders looks very good. And uh, last, there is a philosophy that historically has had some influence called Christianity. Many of you may have heard of it. Uh, yes, you actually have a bunch of cathedrals and so on, uh, monuments to this religion. There may even be some believers still around. Uh, now, you may remember there's a story about the Good Samaritan where the question is, who is my neighbor? And what is the answer? Who is your neighbor according to Jesus? Is it fellow people in Prague? No. Fellow Czechs? No. Fellow EU members? No. Who is your neighbor? Everyone's your neighbor. That is the whole point of it. It is about all human beings are brothers and sisters, right? Regardless of nationality, regardless of these details, the most important thing about a human being is that they are a human being. So I'd say Christianity is very consistent with open borders as well. Uh, now, last, there is another very popular philosophy that is very few professional philosophers who advocate it. It's sometimes called citizenism. It just says countries should do whatever is in the best interest of their own country and the descendants of the people currently in that country. So this is sometimes called citizenism. Anytime you have a politician that just says, look, we should do whatever is best for our country. Does anyone here say that? Yes, or I was just in Hungary. It's a hard language, as you may have heard, but I was able to figure out from the ads there's a bunch of people saying Hungary for the Hungarians. All right, <laughs> all right, so I, I can't say it, but I, I figured it out. All right, <laughs> all right. Now again, I could go and argue with this, but why not just say, all right, fine. Uh, if that's your view, you too should favor open borders, maybe with some pro-native taxes and transfers. So maybe you should do the thing I was talking about where you say foreigners pay extra taxes and then we use this to help natives. But even so, not a good reason to just say no, right? Don't say no, say with the British, certain terms and conditions apply. Let's see, and last, let's see, I think this is the last slide, but let's. Go for it. Yep. All right. So that is the end. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I would now be delighted to take any and all questions that you have about this topic. Or if we are, if we run out of questions about this topic, I'm happy to take questions about any topic at all, actually. I'm just curious what you'll say. So thank you very much. Yes. Works. This one. This one. Also works. Yeah. Great. Uh, so, questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right. Okay. Professor Shima. Right, Brian. Thank you very much for your talk. Also, um, I'd like you to know that I use your book for my globalization oh. class. And Excellent. Actually, like it. And I they like it. Great. <laughs> what a great country. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and I have one question regarding, let's say, pra practical application mm -hmm. Of, mm -hmm. of the general argument. So to what extent your argument would modify or would get modified mm -hmm. when we speak of, let's say, a policy of open borders of a small country mm -hmm. and you know, the, the mm -hmm. world around? So the, it, mm -hmm. does, like, mm -hmm. the magnitude plays a role? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So I was just talking about it with a journalist this afternoon. Uh, so f fact, uh, Luxembourg has the highest per capita GDP in the EU, right? So you might think that everyone in the EU would move to Luxembourg. Uh, they probably have gotten a lot of people that have moved there, but it's still far from the most populous country. 
Uh, what happens when you have a small country that has open borders? One of the big effects is it, just ra is it raises real estate prices so that this creates a natural market reason to decide, okay, maybe I don't want to go there after all. In the United States, a lot of people don't move to Manhattan even though wages are higher there because real estate prices are so high. Uh, of course, in the long run, you can build a lot more housing and going back to my, uh, the book that I'm working on right now, that would also be great. Uh, but uh, the other thing that we were looking at is uh, Czech population density compared to other countries in Europe. So uh, Malta actually has the highest, uh, high, high, highest per capita or highest uh, population density in the EU. But I think second after that is the Netherlands. They have almost five times their population density. Right? So it really is realistic to have 50 million people here in Czechia right now as to how soon this would happen. We actually have a lot of good evidence on this. You know, when you have a true disaster, like an invasion of a country, then you may get millions of people moving in a short amount of time. But otherwise, even when there are large income differences, usually it takes a while for population movements to become large. Uh, let's see, this is a country that gets snow, right? So um, we have a verb in English which is to snowball to snowball. This means that it starts with a little bit of snow at the top of the mountain and that it gradually gets bigger and bigger and bigger like in a Bugs Bunny cartoon. All right, so the empirical pattern for how migration works when you don't have an immediate disaster is that it snowballs. When you first open a border, migration starts happening slowly at first and then gets bigger and bigger. Uh, how does this happen? Well, so you're like, eventually you do get a large, a large movement, but it doesn't generally happen very quickly all at once. Rather, you have plenty of time to plan for it. So I would say that, again, for a smaller country, you would, would in the long run probably get a lot of migrants. It would lead to real estate values increasing, so it would not be the true flood. Um, right now, actually, with Ukraine, I think this is, it is fair actually call it a flood. Normally, people talk about a flood of immigrants, like it's like 100 people, what are you talking about? But you know, if you, anyone that you don't like is a flood, right? Uh, but right now with Ukraine, the situation is so desperate, you really are getting millions of people moving in just a few weeks. Uh, that You say that would be unusual. But yeah, it is reasonable to think that if uh, Czechia were to go and open its borders, you would have a large population increase. But I'll also say that one thing we've learned for the last few weeks is it's totally doable. You really can have your population increase like 5% in like three weeks. I think people before this would have said, no, it's just not physically possible. It is possible. It's just a matter of whether or not you are willing to do it or not. Uh, so I'd say you know, with small areas, like you would of course not get the same kind, uh, the same level of migration that you get in a big country. And some of what happens is that real estate prices go up, which then slows the movement. But Still, you know, like the, the basic logic, I'd say, is the, very similar. Uh, again, if there is the worry, like we might actually get outnumbered by the foreigners, again, that's where the snowballing part is important. Yeah, as long as you've got a typical rate of assimilation, then it really do, you really do need to have a, an enormous amount before the native culture actually does, get to, uh, you know, actually does become min a minority because new, each new generation is learning the culture that we have or the culture that already exists. Just to give you an idea, the United States now has about 100 times as many people as it started with. A lot, you know, so probably a majority of those are descended from immigrants that were not there when the country first began. And yet, guess what our national language still is? It's still the language of the first 1% that first three million people passed on their language because while there was enormous immigration, the way that it worked out is it snowballed and so each generation learned English and then it remained the national language. And of course the culture did change over time, although again, not that much because of immigration, more because young people just didn't like what old people thought. Uh, let's see, other questions? Ah, let's see, let's see a few back there. Let's see, it doesn't seem to be working. Hmm. Chris. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming to Prague once again. And my question is the following. Um, there are obviously additional obstacles for the immigrants, uh, starting from the language barrier to given the massive numbers you presented uh, moving from a less developed country to, to uh, more developed countries. Uh, the, work the workers will be less skilled and educated than the average native. And um, 
will have a worse outlook for getting at least a decently paid uh, a job. And my concern is, uh, since poverty goes hand in then hand with crime, at least in Czech Republic, the poor areas have higher rates of criminality. Uh, what would you say to the people who choose to value their safety more than uh, the ec economic gain? Again, I would say, let's look at the numbers. Let's look at the numbers and see whether the fear is realistic. For the United States, it's really easy because there's very strong evidence that immigrants have lower crime rates than natives. So in the United States, you should be more afraid of natives, actually. The natives are the scary ones, and the immigrants are the safer ones. Uh, I don't know the uh, you know, crime statistics for, uh, for Czechia. Yeah, wait, ah, you do. Hmm? All right, so, well, that makes it easy for me. Uh, there definitely are some European countries where immigrants have higher crime rates than natives. Uh, now, we asked, what's going on? I think the, like, the basic story is that America is a very violent country, Europe is a very nonviolent, or Europe is a very nonviolent area, and immigrants are better than us, but worse than you. So that's a, a way of thinking about it. I'd also say, though, that if you start with a really low base rate for violent crime, someone could have twice the probability of being a violent criminal, and it's still really not that bad. Right. Uh, again, like, although you know, stepping back, you know, the right approach is always look if crime is the problem. Focus on how can we get crime down. So there's obvious things like saying we're going to do a criminal background check, or there's other things like hmm, are we actually going and deterring crime in the best possible way? So rather than saying let's go and punish a lot of people where they where you know, it's 0.2 percent of them are actually criminals, why not go and figure out what we can do in order to handle the crime problem more effectively? Uh, there's a lot of research on this in the United States. I don't know whether you have a lot of criminal criminological research going on here. Uh, in the United States, there's a lot of evidence that we just waste a lot of time on excessive sentences, where basically the deterrent effect of life in prison is very, is very similar to the deterrent effect of 15 years in prison. So there's, that's one story that we're just wasting a lot of resources on unnecessary deterrence. Uh, I'm actually a big fan of a controversial book called In Defense of Flogging, uh, which says that it would be better just to do Singaporean caning on people rather than putting them in jail. Uh, <laughs> it's a good book. Uh, it may sound crazy, but so you read it, it's like, yeah, there's a lot to this. Uh, so, and uh, especially, you know, like, like one of the arguments the author does not make is you know, a lot of crime seems to be impulsive. It's not actually a well reasoned attempt to make money. Like, drunk driving is not lucrative. There's no money in drunk driving. Uh, and the same goes for you know, bar fighting. There's no money in bar fighting. And so, there's a lot of crime that actually is clearly has nothing to do with the desire to make money. Uh, it seems a lot more about impulsive behavior, and one better way of reducing impulsive behavior is to make punishments very quick and severe, right? So rather than saying you were in a bar fight, you're going to jail for 10 years, say you're getting caned 10 times. Uh, anyway, uh, this may seem a little crazy, but it's just an example of trying to think more, more specifically about how can we deal with a crime problem rather than saying let's go and change immigration policy, which has some small effect on this. So, uh, now again, if someone just said, you know, like, you know, the question of, like, you know, the panel of people who had a family member murdered by an immigrant, you know, what do you say to that? You say, hmm, well, honestly, to the person himself, I think I would just say nothing and say this person endured a horrible tragedy. But if someone said we should do whatever that person thinks, say, no, you should not do whatever a person who's endured a personal tragedy thinks. It does not give you wisdom, right? You know, if you talk to someone whose family member was murdered, what should be done is I think we should murder their whole family. No, that's a terrible idea, right? You know, we should not listen to that person. The person has been blinded by grief, and while it would be terrible to be in their situation, they are not a wise person that we should be listening to. Let's see, other questions? Ah, oh, so just wait till you get the mic, please. Yeah, oh. I'm gonna pass. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your oh, lecture. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, first reaction on this. Uh, still, I think you can't move Palestina to Israel. You can't like, move Pal. Ah, yeah, great question. So, if you so if you read the book, um, I never actually say, "Oh, we should do open borders no matter what." I rely heavily on philosopher Michael Humer, who says we should have a strong moral presumption, and then we should look at the evidence and see whether there's some, where there's some very strong reason to not do it. 
right? So the case of Israel, I think it is actually likely that it would cause civil war if they did open borders between Israel and Palestine. I don't think that this is paranoia because there's a pre, there are two previous incidents, one where there was a large inflow of Palestinian refugees into Jordan and there was almost a civil war. Then they were expelled and there was actually was a civil war in Lebanon. Uh, so now even there, I would say, you know, I do not support the state of Israel. <laughs> uh, what the, they do many bad things. And just starting with, well, you know, like, could Israel be a lot more open? And yeah, you know, absolutely, right? So Israel actually used to have work permits for Palestinians, and then they got rid of them, right? And again, why? Uh, so well, like, because there's some very, very slight risk of terrorism if you allow work permits, right? Well, you know, life has risk. It's not reasonable to say no one can, no Palestinian can ever work in Israel because there might be one terrorist attack by one person at one point. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and of course, there's also all of the immigrants from other countries that Israel could take, right? So I mean, it's important that you know, even if there are very specific circumstances where the effects would be really bad, and therefore I'd say it makes sense to say the presumption should not be, you know, the, the presumption's overcome, but not to do anything more, not, not to bend the rule any more than you really have to to avoid a really bad outcome. So I do think Israel could have a lot more migration in from Palestine. They previously did this without, without more than minor negative effects. So I think they really should go back to that. Uh, there's a lot more they could do. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, so I think it is actually the case where it's likely to cause a civil war. Fortunately, I think that's very rarely true. Right. Uh, by the way, I also think it would be a great idea for other countries to take Palestinians uh, because it is a great way of diffusing the situation. You know, in the United States, we actually have immigrant communities of Palestinians and Jews like an hour away and there's no violence. And what's going on? Well, a lot of it is because both groups are so small that there's no prospect of taking over the government, so you might as well just give up and live in peace. Right. Same with, you know, we can let in Serbs and Croats. They don't kill each other in America. So yeah, I think this is a you know, great reason for larger countries to say, we'll take as many people from here as we can, and this is a great way of taking ancient hatreds and just making them go away. Right? And like, you know, how many people in the, the, of the Czech last names in the United States even know that you're supposed to not like Germans, I guess? Right? Slovakians, I heard that it's they hate the Hungarians more than anyone. Uh, so that maybe anyway, I doubt that many people of Slovak descent in the United States even know what they're supposed to be at odds with with Hungarians. But as long as you stay there, the, sort of the, the issues continue. Uh, so, but you know, this is a case where assimilation can go and take long-standing resentments and hatreds and just make them evaporate. Yeah. By the way, there's often an attitude that people have in America say it's really important to go and teach everybody about their historical grievances to prevent them from ever being repeated. Like maybe. Then again, maybe you will cause further conflict by teaching people about it. Imagine that in Yugoslavia in 1991, you could have just given everyone amnesia about what happened before. No one knows whose grandfather was killed by whose grandfather. They probably would have given you peace. And so, yeah, it can actually be bad to spend too much time dwelling on the past. Other questions? Uh, thank, thank you for your talk. Yeah. Oh. I have a mic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was trying to come up with some groups of people that might be, uh, say, rationally opposed to migration. Mm -hmm. uh, to my mind came two groups. Uh, people with extremely high time preference okay. since, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. since the net effects of migration mm -hmm. are more long-term mm -hmm. than short-term and uh, the negative effects of migration are immediate mm -hmm. and they okay. disappear with time. That's one group. And then there's some groups of people uh, that value uh, other things than, say, their material well-being. Uh, for example, the Amish, mm -hmm. they represent this group well. Uh, would there be a case for, uh, say, voluntary associations of property owners of people with these uh, shared ideas that uh, would implement strict migration mm -hmm. policy? Would there, mm -hmm. uh, would there be an argument for them that this is rational given their, uh, given their uh, you know, value scales and so forth? 
All right. Thank it you. takes a strong Austrian influence to these questions. Yes. Um, yes. All right. So the time preference question, yeah, totally true. It's also true. We've got the Austrian argument against vaccination. Yes, the vaccine will save my life, but that's in the future. I don't want to get a shot right now. I don't like Neil. The needle hurts. All right. It's the same argument. All right. And what I'll say is if your standard rationality is that low, then almost everything's rational and you can't really criticize almost uh, really there's very little criticism you can do but i hope that if you were an adult and someone made that argument or like a child made that argument you say yeah well you know, your preferences may be that but they're very foolish preferences and it would be a bad idea to act on them right and as your parent i'm going to make you do the thing that is longer term and wiser um so I'd say that there are others, other, other and better standards. If someone just says, look, I only care about what happens today, the rest of my life makes no difference to me. Um, there's one sense in which you can say that's perfectly rational, uh, but there is a better sense in which you say it's crazy. <laughs> and what about uh, yes, the Amish? Yes, 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 about the Amish. Uh, so there's two different ways of thinking about this. So actually, I was, there was something I was going to say, but then you brought up the Amish, and that changes the answer. <laughs> All right, so usually when people say, well, maybe some people care about cultural problems much more than they care about material income. This is where I'll say, look, there are a few people like this, that, but I think there's not very many. I think most people who claim this are just not sincere. All right, well, why would I say this? Well, actions speak louder than words. So if someone says that he doesn't like living around immigrants because they're messing up his cultural environment, normally that person could move to another low immigration part of his country, but he has not done so. Which to me says that he doesn't believe what he is saying himself. He doesn't actually even care that much. Uh, once I was uh, debating Mark Akorian, the head of the Center for Immigration Studies, probably the most influential anti-immigration think tank in the world, and I asked him, I said, Mark, look, you live in Washington, D.C., one of the highest immigration parts of the United States. So, like, why? If, immig if immigrants make everything so terrible, why do you live here? Now, I was expecting that he would say, you're right, Brian, immigrants are terrible, they do make life terrible. I'm living here because I wanna save America from these horrors that I experience every day. I'm taking one for the team. That was what I thought he was gonna say. He didn't, actually. Instead, he said, yeah, well, there's some good things about immigrants and some bad things. I'm like, well, then why have you devoted your life to preventing immigration if it's just who knows? And I was very confused. And I still am, actually. <laughs> but now in the case of the Amish, I think that is a case where their actions speak just as loud as their words. These are people who say that they don't want to, use, uh, they don't want to have electricity in their homes, and guess what? They don't. Uh, their choice is extremely unusual. Hardly anyone makes that choice, but it's true that a few do. So I would, I would say, yeah, the Amish, when they say that they really want to do this, I believe them. Um, and if they want to go and make an effort to go and create a, a, a separate voluntary society where they have a homeowner association where everyone follows those rules, great. The main thing I would say is that this is nothing like a country. You'd never be able to get that in a country because you don't get that level of agreement in a country. I mean, it's hard even to get that level of agreement on a street. On any one street, there's normally some people just disagree very, very much with each other. So while I totally respect the right of people with very strong and unusual views to form their own separate society where they live that way, I'll just say that in the real world, this just isn't very important. Hardly anyone really wants to do that. Um, you know, it is legal in the United States to go and form communes where you all live in the same way with the same rules. Uh, in my home state of Virginia, there actually is such a commune inspired by the work of B.F. Skinner. If you've ever heard of his book, Walden II, which is a, he, it's a, it's a utopian society, and there's some people who read about this in the 60s, and they formed their utopian society in rural Virginia. Uh, over time, they've changed the rules a lot, because it turns out B.F. Skinner's utopia wasn't really very doable. Uh, like, one of their rules is, like, you can't, you know, is the, everyone has to approve you to join the group. The other one is that everyone starts off getting the very worst jobs. So basically, the first person who shows up in the commune and wants to join, if they agree, then you have to be the person who cleans the bathrooms for a couple of years. And in this way, hardly anyone new wants to join. Most young people leave. The Amish, it's true, the Amish managed to keep their kids in the cult. It's pretty amazing uh, because they do see that other people around 
Um, you know, the Amish are much more flexible than you would realize because their doctrine is not that electricity is evil, but rather that every technology should be evaluated by its propensity to maintain the Amish community. So they will use electricity on the job. They have woodworking shops that are fully electrified, and that's fine. They just don't want any electricity in the house because they think that will undermine the Amish community. So they are more flexible than you might realize, but still, yeah, they are one of the best examples of people living a very different lifestyle and making an effort to do it. Again, my, my answer is basically that some, a small amount of that would exist in a free society, but just not much. Another great example is the kibbutz in, uh, kibbutz in, in, in Israel, you know, where it's a few percent of the population. They also get a lot of government subsidies but you know, some people do it. But they've also changed over time to become much less collectivist. I'd, I'd like to add on that, please. Um, oh, sure. Um, how to say it? There's uh, one way, one, another way uh, to reveal your anti-immigrant preference. Mm -hmm. That is boycott mm -hmm. uh, by refusing to mm -hmm. provide goods or services. Mm -hmm. Though this is strictly illegal in most countries, And f you know, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to. You don't get to choose your mm -hmm. tenant and so mm -hmm. on. And in some places, like for example, even in Czech Republic, the uh, the pr burden of proof when this is the this is like a criminal charge, uh, the burden of proof is on a on the defendant. So that mm -hmm. makes uh, that makes revealing any any like honest anti-immigrant preference mm. even harder. So would, mm. would this be the case uh, against anti-discrimination laws if you want a society based on uh, you know, freedom of association? Mm. Hmm. So I have been writing a lot about all the problems with anti-discrimination laws. I would say that for you know, even if the legally the burden of proof is on the defendant, it's just so hard even to figure out that someone is boycotting you because they don't like your nationality. So you know, like in the, in the so in the United States, the one kind of discrimination that is almost never prosecuted is discrimination by consumers. Right? And, you know, and, you know, and really, like you could go up to someone and say, I was going to buy this from you, but since you're Albanian, I won't. Ha. Huh? <laughs> All right. Again, even when it's legal, hardly ever happens. So I would just say that it's probably not something that matters very much. I mean, I think you know, you know, there are some laws that actually change behavior a lot, like laws against building skyscrapers. And then there are other laws where I think they barely change behavior at all. I just don't think there's very much demand to go and boycott products based upon nationality. Uh, again, in principle, I'd say that you have a right to do it. Um, I mean, I think, you know, like in terms of like actual harm of discrimination law, I think this is one of the very smallest because, in fact, it barely changes behavior anyway. Okay, I have a public choice question. Great. Uh, so, I mean, economists, you know, like to come up with ideas how to make the gains from immigration mm -hmm. shared with the natives, all kind of creative ways. So, most recently, I would say Posner and Whale in the radical markets, they propose these uh, mm -hmm. adopt an immigrant scheme such that it's kind of decentralized, mm -hmm. essentially, you know people can pick up an immigrant and kind of adopt them as a kind of child and share some of the proceeds. Uh, during the Syrian immigration crisis, uh, some European economists were suggesting to make these immigration quotas tradable, mm -hmm. such that, you know, it's just the countries that don't want immigrants can essentially buy themselves out. Uh, before that, these uh, immigrants being paid, some, being charged some upfront fee for entrance, like selling the mm -hmm. visas in auctions, was it Becker or Rosen? Mm -hmm. was, yeah, Becker. And this yeah. never caught on politically, mm -hmm. right? This somehow... It was never got popular. Nobody really adopted this as a serious policy proposal, made a career on how to really kind of sell immigration to voters. So why is that? It seems that, you know, all of these, that the very fact that there are gains to immigration which are not as much shared or visibly shared with the natives, that doesn't seem to be the main obstacle. So mm -hmm. why is that? Why these don't help? What is really the main mm -hmm. obstacle? And a normative question, what would you mm -hmm. do to kind of mm -hmm. really elevate the opposition against the... Yeah, yeah you know, great question. Uh, if you know my first book, which uh, Prime Minister knew, the, the Myth of the Rational Voter, it's like you know, voters' opinions have everything to do with emotion and very little to do with math. So the problem is all these economic proposals are trying to go and appeal to people with 
with math and say, look, I figured out a way that you can actually come out ahead on this, just give me a chance. And actually in the real world, this is almost the last thing on voters' minds. Voters have a very impulsive immediate reaction and then it's very hard to change that with anything other than a different really powerful emotional reaction. Right, so you could start with, you know, I mean, maybe like, you know, See, two months ago, if you were to tell people, hey, we should go and let in millions of Ukrainian refugees, people would say no. And then you see on the news their country's getting attacked, and then people say, oh my God, yes. Right, this is the way politics actually usually works. So it's why these more creative ideas are not very effective, I think. I mean, basically these kinds of creative ideas to work, they need to be ones that, that for decisions that are really already left to a small group of technocrats, so things like nominal GDP targeting, that's an idea with hope because no normal person has any idea what any of the words in that phrase means. Uh, so, so whereas people who work for central banks do know what they mean. So I mean that's an idea that I think has promise because the people who know what you're talking about are people that are quantitatively inclined and will actually sit there and say, all right, so I can see some possible advantages from nominal GDP targeting. Um, in a way, the advantage is precisely because most people find monetary policy so boring, hardly anyone has a strong opinion about it. And then it's possible for a more creative idea to actually get some traction. Um, in terms of what you really need to do in order to change people's minds, uh, well, uh, of course, you could translate open borders into every language. Uh, it's a little, little bit of, you know, it's a little bit of joke, but I will say that when I wrote this book, I was thinking very hard about how can I actually make this book persuasive to people who don't agree at first, right? Anyone can preach to the choir. I wanted to write a book that would change people's minds. I didn't think I was going to change the minds of people who were just super anti-immigration, but I thought I, so I could change the minds of people who were just undecided or to say, I don't know about this. And I know I've succeeded in that very well. Now, how? I think a, a lot of it was not just the arguments, but the presentation, right? And trying to manage the emotional tone of the book. Uh, when my artist was drawing the book, I actually would send him emails saying, make my smile 3% bigger, right? I would really do things like that. I wanted to get the emotional tone of the book just right for maximum persuasion. You know, the Brian Kaplan in the book is much better than the real Brian Kaplan. The Brian Kaplan in the book, every little, every little thing he does is choreographed to be perfect, or at least as perfect as I can make it, whereas I'm just me, just a regular human being with all sorts of flaws and saying the wrong thing at the wrong time and having the wrong emotional expression. So I have all of these drawbacks the character in the book does not. Uh, when people just say, like, what are, the, what are the arguments that will really help us to win? My general reaction to this, not just for immigration, but for almost all free market policy reforms, say, look, our arguments are great. We've got fantastic arguments. We've got the best arguments anyone's ever come up with. What we don't have is a good attitude. We need to improve our attitude. Like, well, what's wrong with my attitude? Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> What we really need is to work on ha having the friendliest possible attitude, being super nice to everyone, turn the other cheek. If someone treats you badly, it's as if it didn't happen. Just talk, you know, at, at worst comes to worst. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. These are all techniques that, first of all, I, I think have been very, very effectively argued for by many self-help people, such as Dale Carnegie in his great book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I think also, insofar as there is empirical work in psychology, like, you don't change people's minds by saying, fools like you believe. Look, maybe they are fools, but the, you know, you're not gonna get anywhere by saying that. Who's the bigger fool, the fool or the person who thinks that calling someone a fool will change his mind? Like, does not work. Right. The way that actual persuasion in the real world works uh, is step one, you have to make friends with people. That's the first step. They have to feel like, the, like you are their friend, right? That you are a decent person, that you treat them well. Once you are there, that's when you could actually start having a fruitful conversation. Now, this isn't a general thing that any one of us can do. It's something each of us has to try doing. Each person who wants to make the world better must be an ambassador for his views, right? You can either be someone that makes your side look bad, or you can be someone who makes your side look good, right? I encourage everyone to try to be someone who makes their side look good, right? And by the way, I say this not because I'm so great. 
Like when I was young, I was terrible. <laughs> yes, that, what fools like you think, how many times did I say that when I was 17 years old? Right. Uh, but I have tried to improve and I think I've gotten better over time and I'm still trying to get better yet. So that's what I'd advise everyone to do is just to try to be a great ambassador for your views. And yes, while arguments are great, much more important is just being super friendly to everyone no matter how they treat you. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, we have to uh, end the formal round of this uh, annual lecture. It's been two hours. It flew by very quickly, yeah. but we have other business to do, like the informal session with drinks and, and food and informal talks with Professor Kaplan if he, if he stays here for a little longer. I would like to thank uh, the Anglo-American University, Mr. Schwartz, Mrs. Holushova. I would like to uh, thank my co-workers, especially Gabina, Honza, and Kuba for uh, making this event possible. I would like to thank uh, the audience for coming here and for, for your attention. I would like to like uh, I would like to um, thank our friends in Poland, Hungary, and Slovakia who uh, who made this trip possible. Um, and I have one final note here that if you want to buy this book, uh, Open Borders, or other books that we that we sell, you should do it as soon as possible after after the formal formal thing ends because we have to pack up the shop uh, quickly. I understand. So. Now it's my honor and pleasure to finally do the very formal thing. I have to read the sentence because it's long. <laughs> the uh, Liberal Institute Annual Award for contributing to the proliferation of ideas of liberty and free competition for honoring private property and the rule of law is given today to Professor Brian Kaplan. Thank you so much. You guys have been great. Thank you and see you in the next room. <laughs>